joining us today uh, for today's webinar, which is titled uh, Mobilization and Political Uncertainty, What Future for Syrian Civil Society in the Diaspora? Uh, my name is Sarah Ann Rennick, and I'm with the Arab Reform Initiative. And today's webinar actually marks the fourth in a new series we've been hosting of discussions entitled uh, The New Arab Diasporas. This has been a series of discussions over the past few months that's been looking at the demographic, social, and political changes to Arab diasporas since 2011 uh, as a result of economic crises or renewed authoritarianism or indeed conflict in many cases and how the nature of the diasporas has changed, who is in the diaspora has changed, where these diasporas are located, but also the types of transnational politics and transnational mobilization that is going on. And we've been particularly interested in studying and in exploring uh, what different factors mediate this transnational mobilization, uh, including things like the political opportunity structure, both in host countries, but also back in the homeland, uh, the different types of actions that diasporas can take uh, for purposes of peace building, for example, for the purposes of um, creating political change back home, but also reasons why maybe diasporas decide not to engage things like transnational oppression or the positionality of the diaspora uh, that does not permit the space for organization or mobilization. Um, and we've been looking a lot at how conflict dynamics and how the way conflict evolves over time and the way conflict ends shapes the way diasporas act and the, the, the opportunities they have for mobilization and for having an impact uh, back in home countries, but also how um, these diasporas are affecting host countries and changing political processes uh, and political practices in host countries. So uh, I'm very excited for today's webinar in particular because we are looking at the Syrian diaspora and Syrian civil society and diaspora, uh, looking at both the Syrian civil society in uh, neighboring countries to Syria, so in the Middle East, but also in Europe and comparing and contrasting their different forms of mobilization and forms of organization and the different reasons for this. And I'm very pleased to be joined today uh, by two researchers who have written an excellent report on this subject. Uh, we have Eleni Dikar, who is a migration researcher at the United Nations University and Maastricht University, and Nora Jasmine Ragab, who is a postdoctoral researcher also at the UN University and Maastricht University. And as I said, they have written an excellent report looking at the potentials, limits, and future scenarios for the Syrian uh, civil society and diaspora in the Middle East and in, um, and in Europe which I highly recommend and we will have a link available to that um, after this webinar. And they're gonna be sharing with us the different factors that mediate uh, the different forms of engagement, both at the organizational, but also the strategic levels of these diaspora uh, groups uh, and how these have evolved over time with the changing conflict dynamics, but also dynamics in host countries. And also I think what's going to be a particular uh, interest today is the future scenario. So where the diaspora, what are the options? What are the possible ways we can imagine that the diaspora, the Syrian diaspora is going to be um, acting towards Syria based on the different ways this conflict may or will end and sort of mapping out those and reflecting on those different possibilities for the Syrian diaspora um, as the conflict winds down and eventually does conclude. So just as a few matters of housekeeping today, so we will start first with the two presentations, first by Eleni and then by Nora, um, about 20, 15, 20 minutes each, and then we'll open the floor to discussion. For those that are joining us on Zoom, uh, you can simply ask questions um, in the Q&A section at the bottom. And for those joining us on Facebook Live, uh, you can simply ask questions in the comments section. Those will be, those will be transferred to us. So I'll go ahead now and turn it over to and I believe, I believe she has a PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for also summarizing uh, very well what we are going to talk about today. Uh, so um, I will right away share my screen um, and tell you about our uh, project. So uh, we conducted this study into, uh, in late 2018 and early 2019. And uh, this study was commissioned to us by the Danish Refugee Council and the German Development Agency, GIZ. 
and in which try, we try to explore the potential limits and future roles of Syrian civil society in the Middle East and in Europe uh, by focusing on six host countries, uh, Lebanon, Turkey, United Kingdom, Germany, France, and uh, Denmark. So um, to give you a brief background of uh, uh, why we wanted to conduct this study. So as many of you know, what started in Syria uh, as a peaceful demonstration of uh, Syrian people demanding justice, equality, and peace has escalated into a large-scale conflict which dragged in regional and global actors. And it had devastating consequences for the Syrian community inside Syria, but also it uh, sparked collective action of uh, diaspora actors uh, of Syrians residing all across the world in different uh, countries, mainly among the opponents of the Syrian regime, but also among the supporters of the regime. So the Syrian uprising in 2011 uh, can be considered a transformative event, uh, which uh, prompted uh, exceptional levels of mobilization among the diaspora actors who wanted to play a role in the social and political transformation, the transformations that are ongoing in the country of origin, but also to address the needs of the communities that are affected by the conflict. So the host countries that are hosting Syria's displaced populations have seen the emergence and development of this vibrant uh, and politically and socially engaged civil society that is led by Syrians. But there has, it has been almost a decade since the conflict has started. So we have also seen that the aspirations, the objectives and the missions of these uh, civil society actors, of these diaspora actors have changed, have evolved in line with the changing dynamics of the conflict and also in line with the changing needs of the communities affected by the conflict. So to capture this changing uh, dynamics and how it influenced the space and actions of diaspora actors, uh, we, the primary question we asked was how different civil society actors, Syrian civil society actors, will be able to and are already adjusting to changing realities inside and outside Syria. And in order to answer this question, we try to identify the key opportunities and challenges arising from different political opportunity structures on the home country level, host country level, but also imposed by the international context. So our aim was to understand the factors that uh, constrain or facilitate the actions of uh, actions and space of the civil society. And secondly, we also tried to gather uh, the perspectives of uh, different diaspora actors regarding future scenarios and uh, potential fields of action in the future. Try to understand, to, to shed light on how their priorities may change in different scenarios. And lastly, we, this study also gave us the opportunity to make a comparison of the distinct regional settings, one being Europe and the other Middle East. So we also were able to understand, um, identify some of the context uh, specific factors, uh, region specific factors uh, that are influencing the mobilization patterns of diaspora groups. And we used a conceptual, we relied on a conceptual framework First, we de define diasporas as a product of a mobilization process. So there is still no universally accepted definition of the concept of diaspora. It is still a vague concept, but it is widely agreed that diasporas do not form as a result of emigration, but they rather emerge through an active process of mobilization. So it is not the characteristics of the transnational communities that we are uh, dealing with it is the transnational ac activities, the practices of these communities that make them a diaspora. And secondly, we also relied on the framework that has been developed by uh, Chaudhary and Moss 2016, which argues that the space and actions of diaspora actors are influenced by uh, by factors uh, in different political opportunity structures on three different levels. First is the home country political context. Second is the host country political context, because this is the context in which the organizations are operating, but also the international political context. And at the same time, it's not only this uh, diverse political opportunity structures on three different levels, but also their interaction that is influencing the space and actions of diaspora actors. But more importantly, we also acknowledge that it's not a one-way process. So it's also the, uh, the diaspora actors who have the agency to negotiate and even transform these political opportunity structures, which makes it a two-way process. 
So our methodology, uh, we defined our target group as the representatives of Syrian civil society organizations based in Turkey, Lebanon, France, Germany, Denmark, UK. And we also had participants coming from inside Syria. We had four participants uh, attending the workshops in Beirut. The workshop in Beirut. We, in total, we had five workshops, uh, Beirut, Istanbul, Gaziantep, Berlin, and London. Uh, we had two workshops in Turkey to capture the diverse civil society landscape there by first doing this in, the, in a border city in Gaziantep and the second uh, metropole like Istanbul, which is currently hosting more than half a million Syrian refugees. And we did our field, field work uh, between December 2018 and February 2019. In total, we had uh, 71 participants representing a, a total of 63 civil society organizations. And we also had two academicians and two journalists who are uh, active on an individual level, but not affiliated with an organization. And in addition to the workshops, we also had uh, nine semi-structured interviews. Uh, with key Syrian actors and also with one uh, Turkish stakeholder who is working with Syrian uh, organizations inside Turkey. And the majority of our participants were from Turkey, followed by Germany, uh, United Kingdom, Denmark, France. So moving on to our findings, uh, what are the challenges and opportunities for Syrian diaspora actors? As I mentioned in our conceptual framework, we, we discussed uh, these uh, factors on three different levels. So I will now start with the home country level with Syria. So uh, the major and maybe the most obvious challenge arising from the context inside Syria is the lack of security and stability, which creates a sense of uh, unpredictability among the uh, among the Syrian civil society actors, especially those that are working, uh, that are working cross, that are doing cross-border operations in the country. So this is on the one hand preventing accessing the communities in need, uh, creating a um, pre preventing timely access to the communities in need, the conflict dynamics, but at the same time it is also posing a constant security threat for workers, because civil society workers conducting operations inside Sir, uh, inside Syria have frequently become targets of uh, fighting parties. Uh, and therefore, the interference of the par fighting parties in delivery of aid is also leading to an unequal distribution of aid. And similarly, um, in relation to this point, uh, it was also argued by our participants that uh, the compromises made by the United Nations uh, to comply with the demands of the regime also resulted in a politicization of aid. So this was, um, this quote is also pointing on this issue, say uh, the, this was uh, a humanitarian actor working inside Syria who said that the government uses humanitarian aid. So there is like a certain community which is known as anti-government or controlled by opposition forces. Then the aid coming to this community will not be similar, neither the aid nor the services like water or electricity. It will never be similar to what other communities loyal to the government will get. So this was also argued in uh, previous studies. This was uh, found in previous studies that the UN-led humanitarian system inside Syria uh, has turned into a vehicle through which uh, the Syrian regime was able to turn uh, the conflict, the humanitarian assistance, assistance into its own advantage by using denial of aid as a weapon of war. And another uh, widely discussed issue was regarding the internal displacement in, uh, situation inside Syria. So Syria is also, currently Syria has the highest uh, internal displacement figures with uh, more than 6.5 million internal displaced persons. And when we think about, when we, when we talk about integration or social inclusion, we often tend to think about refugees in their host states, but what receives relatively less attention is the a situation of the local integration and social inclusion of internally displaced persons in their new local context. So it was argued by the participants uh, that, the, uh, that the, the segregation of internally displaced persons uh, in their new local context is creating a challenge, especially for organizations that are working inside Syria. This is perceived as a challenge in rebuilding and empowering local communities. And last but not the least on the home country level is uh, the limited civic engagement of women uh, in civil society organizations, but also in local councils inside Syria. 
So despite increasing visibility, uh, it is argued that decision, and it's also obvious we have also seen it uh, during our field work, at least in our, uh, among our participants, uh, the decision-making levels are largely occupied by men. Uh, there are some good practices that are highlighted, especially in the northern regions, uh, but also by independent civil society organizations in regime held areas. But in many other parts of Syria, uh, it is perceived that the impact of customs and traditions, the cultural factors and the absence of laws that protect women uh, is still preventing a barrier to engagement of women in civic life. And moving on to host country level, uh, each host country has distinct challenges, but the discussions were mainly centered around uh, asylum policies, integration policies, but also the position of each host state within the Syrian conflict dynamics. So in terms of asylum policies, each country has different challenges. For example, in Turkey, uh, the freedom of uh, the lack of uh, freedom of mobility for Syrian refugees, or in Denmark and France, the regulations that uh, facilitate the return of refugees or in Germany, the tightening family reunification regulations. These are all seen as challenges for organizations that are providing direct assistance to asylum seekers and refugees. And in terms of integration policies, another critic uh, was widely uh, voiced, uh, arguing that the host country approach to social cohesion programs is often uh, neglecting the diversity within refugee populations and treat refugee populations as a homogeneous group and undermine the, the struggles that have been imposed on these communities by the experience of uh, forced displacement, the identity struggles of the refugee populations. And uh, yet again, women's empowerment was another uh, issue that discussed, which presented both opportunities and challenges. So it was acknowledged that uh, by our participants that women become increasingly present in uh, social, economic and civic life, especially in European countries, but also in some parts of uh, the region. But they still remain, uh, but the, their representation in decision making roles is still uh, limited. And on, the other, on another note, uh, although it is promising that women are gaining new roles uh, and which contribute to their social and economic empowerment, uh, without renegotiation of gender roles, without renegotiation of the domestic chores or childcare responsibilities within a household, there is a risk that this may create an additional burden on women rather than contributing to a genuine process of empowerment. Another point was regarding the funding opportunities, which considerably vary by sector and also by country, uh, which presents an opportunity for some and a challenge for others. For example, in Lebanon, it seemed that um, there was more funding opportunities for organizations working in the education field, whereas in Turkey, at, that, at the time of our research, at least, these dynamics might have changed at the moment. But uh, so, uh, social cohesion and social integration activities in Turkey were generally more supported. And in general, humanitarian operations and cross-border operations are often well-funded, whereas advocacy and justice efforts are usually uh, lacking uh, sufficient support by uh, donor organizations. And uh, another point was regarding the regulations imposed on uh, Syrian civil society organizations that are doing cross-border operations within the borders of the host countries. This was per particularly the case in the Turkish context uh, where the Turkish government is called controlling uh, some parts of the Syrian territory and imposing their own regulations on the Syrian uh, organizations. And it was perceived by uh, actors working in these operations, it was perceived to be a time-consuming and complex procedure which sometimes delays the operations and uh, hinders uh, timely access to the communities in need. And again on the host country level, uh, regarding in the fields of justice and advocacy, we were able to observe a distinction between the regions. So the relatively uh, political, uh, politically stable environments in European countries provided uh, greater resources uh, in these fields, and especially in the field of justice, uh, the universal jurisdiction uh, principle that is uh, implemented by, for example, Germany and France uh, allows these governments to prosecute uh, serious crimes against humanity, regardless of where or by whom these crimes were committed. So, for example, in April 2020, there was a 
Germany hosted the first trial against a Syrian uh, against a Syrian regime official. Uh, and this was um, such developments are generally well received by the diaspora actors, and it is argued that this could uh, that such efforts could actually restore the trust of the uh, Syrian community in the international uh, system. Uh, but on the other hand, um, in, in the advocacy uh, field, we also observed a similar pattern uh, where we had uh, the uh, where we have seen that the, the actors working in the European host country context are generally uh, generally have more space and freedom to uh, voice their political uh, political opinions whereas the fragile political and social context in neighboring countries in Turkey and Lebanon uh, often limit the space to the voices that align with the government ideologies and uh, challenges and opportunities on the international level on the inter the discussions we had uh, regarding the the factors on the international le level were uh, uh, i mean we're not limited to this but these two points were probably the most heated and long discussions that we had and the first one was regarding the representation of syrian civil society uh, in the international events in the peace uh, process in the international on, on the negotiation tables or international conferences so it was perceived that the selection of uh, syrian civil society actors uh, the selection of the representing uh, parties representing actors on these international events is biased towards uh, with a preference towards uh, either organizations that have similar political views with inviting parties or humanitarian actors who are expected uh, to be neutral in their uh, political views. So this was also highlighted by one of the interview, uh, interview uh, respondents that uh, we had. Uh, and he said, this is also a humanitarian actor who is doing uh, operations, humanitarian operations inside Syria. And he said, the UN in Damascus accuses us for taking certain positions or making certain statements or on certain occasions. But in the end, we are Syrians and we, the organization has its identity, which we are proud of. So we can't be split from what is happening in our country. I think this is reflecting very well the dilemma that is faced by the organizations, but also the depoliticization of the space by the international actors. So on the one hand, uh, by expecting humanitarian actor, the, the, the humanitarian actors who are politically neutral, engaging these actors in the very political discussions on the situation, on the conflict dynamic inside Syria is perceived as a targeted effort to depoliticize the space given to the civil society. But at the same time, it is also creating a strongly politicized context uh, by doing this to reach a certain political goal. And another contested issue was regarding the dichotomy between uh, justice and reconciliation. So here we heard uh, contradicting views. Uh, the views of diaspora actors somewhat contradicted with the views of uh, the actors that are based inside Syria. So for the diaspora actors, achieving justice is a priority for many diaspora actors. Achieving justice seemed to be a priority or as a precondition for reconciliation or peace. Uh, but on the other hand, when we discuss the same issue, discuss this issue with actors that are based inside Syria, they had concerns regarding the, 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 the efforts of justice that are pushed uh, by the by the by the or either the international committee or diaspora actors because of the deep divisions in the society. So it was argued that the context inside Syria is not ripe for uh, intensifying justice efforts because there are very deep divisions and uh, starting with justice efforts without reconciling the, com uh, the communities inside the country may deepen the lines of the conflict. And this quote is from one of the uh, diaspora actors who said that reconciliation on the other hand is not an innocent term. It is used by the Assad government to surrender some groups. Therefore, the correct usage would be justice or reconciliation. Our motto is to achieve peace. We all agree on that, but justice cannot be realized with re reconciliation. Reconciliation cannot be accepted without justice. Um, and the last point that I would like to highlight before leaving the floor to Nora is regarding the civil society landscape 
So it was argued that the increased opportunities for funding and the large presence of uh, the entry of international uh, non-governmental organizations and also the increasing operations of United Nations in this field has somewhat professionalized the civil society sector, which has both advantages and disadvantages. So on the one hand, uh, many NGOs had access to funding opportunities and many of them has become implementing partners of this large uh, professionalized organizations. They, on the one hand, they helped these big organizations uh, in increasing, enhancing their outreach and also with the local context knowledge, but they were also able to, the, or the NGOs were also able to build their capacities, learn uh, different methods uh, or uh, somewhat ensure a sustainable funding source for their organizations. But at the same time, they had little role in decision making when it comes to designing the projects, but mainly worked as implementing partners the, on the implementation part of the project cycle. Uh, on the other hand, the increased funding opportunities also created, uh, led to marketization of the sector, which in turn creates a sometimes hostile and competitive environment for funding, which would eventually, which can eventually lead to uh, diminished chances for having a unified voice, having a coordinated voice. Um, yeah, these were the points that I would like to discuss. Now I'm would like to leave the floor to Nora. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Eleni, and thank you also, Sara, and all the others from Arab Reform Initiative for providing us also the opportunity to present here. So I will continue uh, with uh, some reflections on the future scenario and solutions, and um, which I can say were not that easy to identify and also that straightforward. Uh, Eleni, you have to move the the slides, I guess. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so what was one of the main findings actually, which we had that the shape and nature of the political settlement in Syria will be the main determinant of the future holds within civil society. I will start actually also with this uh, quote uh, of an um, interview uh, which we had and because I feel it yeah, discusses quite uh, nicely the different options for civil society in the future. So uh, the partner thing said, I think uh, a lot of people are looking at the future as Syrian government will control a big part of Syria or almost all of Syria again. So where will the society life will be? Will it resume to work with the refugees? Will it try to solve the situation with the government and try to set up an office inside Damascus? or to be, try to become an international organization and go to work in other missions, such as in Africa, Yemen, or in Libya. I think uh, Syrian CSO have very limited choices after these eight years. And what we see from this quote is that there are really different options being discussed among the participants, um, and that the reflections on strategies and solutions, which I will be talking about also briefly in a bit, uh, are shaped by different opportunities and constraints present in the different host country contexts. So we see a distinct uh, discussion maybe taking place in Turkey, for example, in Gaziantep, the, we couldn't even use the term justice or reconciliation because it was seen as a normalization of the Syrian government or the normalization of the situation. Whereas in Germany uh, or in, in general in the European in contest, uh, justice was seen as a strong solution, especially as Eleni uh, talked about uh, the legal system and the legal opportunity structures as there actually to, to make use of this uh, uh, strategy. Um, but we also see actually that uh, even within uh, the workshops or among the participants with a specific uh, country context, we see uh, that different solutions also reflect the diversity of the civil society's landscape in each of the country contexts. So we see actually that um, the different discussions were shaped not only by different ideologies, identities, but also sometimes the capacity of organizations. So uh, again, um, making, um, <laughs> uh, uh, discussing uh, the last point, the shift of mission towards a country, country conflict. This was mainly addressed by uh, actors, Syrian civil society actors, which became 
actually quite um, professionalized and place of the humanitarian system. For them, it might be easier to shift context, whereas a smaller uh, organization operating on lower capacity, this might not uh, first of all be feasible, but also not uh, necessarily the aim to do, because they have maybe a stronger identity and stronger relation towards the context of Syria, whereas bigger professionalized organizations become yeah, more international in their, their approaches. Um, reflecting on the strategies and solution, um, again, here was not a straight way forward, um, but one aspect which was highlighted, and we'll be also discussing it again when we compare the different uh, country, uh, country conflict, is that actually Within all the context, there was this aspect that there was a perception that the Syrian civil society is highly fragmented. So in order to kind of to be a big player also in the future for the civil society, um, they felt that, that there is a need for to kind of promote forms of coordination, cooperation and dialogue. Um, because without a strong basis and a strong, more unified voice, uh, uh, many perceive actually that they will actually have a limited influence inside, but also outside Syria. And this is, of course, also something which we see often in diaspora um, poli and politics discussion, that actually uh, the more unified, the more bigger uh, diaspora, the stronger the unified uh, voice is, uh, the stronger the lobbying efforts are, the easier, the better they are also positioned kind of to influence policy making, again, both up, uh, inside uh, the home country, but then also in the host country context. Um, there was an issue, I would say, which was um, the uh, spark the highest or the more contentious discussions actually in this was a question whether a space in an independent society in government controlled areas, which many saw as being the main future for uh, Syria, at least in the near future. Uh, yeah, if there will be an independent space for civil society or if, or if the society will be kind of uh, instrumentalized by the government. So this really sparked a lot of discussions. On the one hand, especially in Europe, also some people were saying that it's not possible actually to work with civil society inside Syria because uh, the civil society, at least in uh, regime-controlled areas, but also in opposition-controlled areas, are often kind of uh, instrumentalized by different conflict actors uh, and therefore cannot really be uh, an independent uh, um, civil society which is based on human rights issues. On the other hand, uh, other actors said that it's actually crucial to continue working with the civil society inside Syria, on the one hand, because it's important for the diaspora not to lose the links with the reality on the ground, but then also on the other hand, if there will be a conflict transformation coming, then we already build structures inside the country to kind of continue our work as civil society. And another aspect which we saw that and I guess from my observation, at least, is something which I feel is continuously ongoing is due to the limited access uh, to Syria or to inside Syria, that organization may shift their focus towards the influence uh, or act uh, um, that from direct influence or activities inside Syria towards exerting an indirect influence on the host country or in international decision making. And this is, for example, also what Eleni already highlighted, the universal jurisdiction can be one way where uh, the civil society actors or diaspora act in the host countries engage actually in um, and uh, yeah, justice efforts in the host country were directed towards Syria. Yeah. Another way uh, which was uh, the focus on is kind of uh, advocacy work and challenging the normalization of the, the Syrian uh, regime, but also um, somehow a focus more towards uh, the Syrian community outside. So uh, there's also the recognition that maybe a uh, return might not be a feasible option in the near future, and therefore efforts are shifted towards building a diaspora community, a strong uh, with, uh, yeah, a community and dialogue and kind of reflection on a common uh, identity among Syrians. 
When we look now at the competitive assessment, and already Eleni, I guess, gave a, a quite good overview of the different contextual factors, uh, but we try to understand the, the difference uh, or try to compare the different contexts on a contextual level, but then also on a temporal level and a spatial level. And I would uh, continue uh, first start with the um, contextual dimension. And we see here, and this is also what Eleni already touched upon, that the relative pluralist and democratic political and societal context in uh, Europe uh, tend on the one hand to enable political mobilization, but it also tended to enable collectivities uh, to unfold their sub identity and This was really interesting for us to see that, for example, in Europe, uh, also uh, minority groups, if you want to call them like this, like for example, Kurdish, were also able to kind of mobilize around a Syrian Kurdish identity, whereas, for example, the neighboring country context didn't allow for this. And this is mainly due to the aspect in Turkey being uh, uh, still a policy uh, or the uh, a state which emphasizes a unified national entity rather than uh, acknowledging minority rights. And this was mainly then making it very difficult for Kurdish to, Syrian Kurdish to mobilize on their sub identities. Uh, and in Lebanon, also the very fragile system actually tried to prevent uh, uh, mobilization around uh, sub identities. Um, we see that core policy targeting in the civil society are actually uh, perceived much more favorable in Europe and in Turkey, so setting up an organization, but also then the freedoms of uh, civic participation, freedom of speech. Whereas in Lebanon, Syrians had very limited chances of establishing new organizations. So we saw that actually for the civil society in Lebanon, the legal space, uh, the, the space for setting up an organization was very, very limited. Uh, what Eleni already also touched upon, and this might have changed also with donor priorities, but uh, in the last years, but what we saw uh, still happening in 2018, 19, when we did uh, our workshop is that the donor industry in the region created really this inter uh, internationalized political opportunities so with where it made it really easy to access funding. Um, which we didn't see so far in Europe that much. So in Europe, we still see that many organizations actually rely on membership fees and donations, whereas uh, the, uh, in the region, and especially in Asia, as being a hub of international organization and cross-border activities for Syria, at least at time, it was easier to access funding. But we see, um, and this was also the case for Europe, that funding actually varies. And this is what uh, Eleni already said, we see that humanitarian relief, and this was also uh, discussed in the European context, is actually the field which received the most funding as well as short-time relief, where it's actually organization active in political work or advocacy or human rights uh, were less likely actually to receive funds. And uh, when we look at the spatial dimension, and with the spatial dimension, we look at geographies. And what we see, the geographies do uh, influence also the civil society space when it comes to the Syrian context. We see that um, Syrian organizations in the neighboring country have relatively less political space, which is not only a result of the contextual factors within each of the countries, but also a result of the uh, uh, post-2011 involvement of Turkey and Lebanon in the Syrian conflict. So we see the spillovers of the Syrian conflict as well the inter-regionalization of the Syrian conflict with both actors being engaged in the conflict or parts of the countries, like in the case of Lebanon, Hezbollah. We see that it's really uh, shaped uh, the, the space also for um, <clears throat> Syrian diaspora uh, act or diaspora or civil society actors. And this is something which um, was also discussed in the literature that the near diaspora maybe is confronted with more threats actually, and therefore has limited space to mobilize politically. In contrast, and this was also confirmed by our uh, study, uh, was that civil and political rights in the European host countries 
are seen as crucial enablers actually of civil student civil society engagement uh, and really provided the space. But at the same time, even in new people said that the discursive opportunities changed throughout the con uh, conflict. So whereas uh, in the beginning, actually, they were able to really mobilize politically, uh, for example, in opposition to the regime, they felt like with the increasing securization of the conflict, and the so-called uh, European, uh, or printed, debated as European cri refugee crisis, they saw that uh, the shift, the discursive shift, was going towards more uh, sector uh, securization, meaning that uh, it resulted actually in a limited space to, yeah, to uh, mobilize politically. But it shifted also again in Europe towards a more humanitarian and um, uh, when it comes to refugees and integration approach. What we see uh, as well as a final finding in the spatial dimension is that uh, the geographical proximity of the neighboring countries allowed for more frequent uh, cross-border and continuous cross-border movements and exchange. And through this, the everyday realities actually inside Syria were experienced more closely uh, with by the actors in the region compared to those in the diaspora in Europe, which tended to kind of more uh, uh, yeah, since experience actually with the context of Syria. And we sometimes saw that this allowed for more balanced reflections on the conditions on the ground. But again, here we have to mention that the geographies inside Syria are also fragmented. So, for example, uh, we see different realities uh, of actors in Turkey compared to different realities in Lebanon because uh, civil society actors tend to be connected to specific regions uh, inside Syria, which all have their distinct uh, conflict history. And finally, and I guess maybe I will finish with that and don't provide the policy recommendation, but also want to have a space for discussion. Uh, we see a temporal dimension and the, we see that the onset and development of the Syrian conflict triggered large scale collective action. And this is also what Eleni already taught, uh, said. So we see actually that with the emergence of the conflict, but also then the different uh, developments of the conflict actually shaped or sparked collective action and uh, led to a vibrant civil society. We see also an institutionalization and organization learnings as an important trajectory of uh, Syrian diaspora mobilization, um, where we see that actually engagement which is other also um, led to yeah more professionalized uh, engagement with the conflict but also with other actors but at the same time we see also that the social political dynamics of the conflict are both reproduced and transformed in the space of civil society so we see and our report highlights more often that to a certain degree the the conflict dynamics in diaspora uh, in syria are also reproduced in the diaspora um, but I see it, it was also countered by the institutionalization. So I will really finish my, my presentation with one, one account of one participant. And he was saying, actually, when we met in 2011, we were all uh, excited. Everybody was discussing different opinions. When we met in 2012, we were, had heated discussions, almost screaming at each other. In 2013, we were almost fighting with hands with each other. In 2017, we were all resignated and crying. But now we learn and learn and uh, we can come together. And in this occasion, he said in this workshop, and we can uh, discuss actually sensitive topics. So it's also about learning to deal with each other and to deal with differences. And with this, uh, I close my presentation. Okay, thank you so much to, to both of you for such an interesting uh, and very rich presentation and your study in general. I've taken a lot of notes and there's a lot of things that I hope we're going to be able to have time to get into in the, in the discussion. Um, and some of the things I found particularly interesting is this tension between politicization and depoliticization and this dilemma it poses to act as both a humanitarian actor that's not supposed to be political, and yet force, you know, if there's going to be participation in peace building processes, for example, that's not necessarily value neutral.
Um, and how do civil society actors deal with those tensions? Um, and as well as with the fact that they are receiving funds from external stakeholders, and that also can lead to you know, questions of co-optation or um, even mission drift. And I think those are really interesting things um, that I hope we'll be able to address. And the other thing that you had mentioned, Nora, that I found so interesting was about a possible scenario for the more professional associations to perhaps start working on other issues for other diaspora groups and homeland and conflicts that are not necessarily the Syrian conflict. Um, and I think, you know, I'd be very interested to hear your ideas about uh, these new forms of solidarity, maybe across different diaspora groups and to what extent that's happening right now already, um, or if this is something that you, you're more seeing in a future process, uh, even if it's just ad hoc right now, what, what is happening in these terms of solidarities between different diaspora groups um, in Europe or in neighboring countries. Um, but I'll go ahead now um, and open the floor to, to the discussion. So we have a first question about international stakeholders. I think this is a really um, uh, appropriate question because this is a question we do hear all the time, which is uh, how, what should their priorities be for supporting civil society, both inside and in outside Syria? And if I could just add to that, um, what, what is the space or is there a role for international stakeholders in uh, bridging this fragmentation? and creating this space for diaspora groups to jointly plan future scenarios and action plans. Thank you. It's, I think it's a very good question and I think it's really valid at the moment. And also considering that the funding opportunities are actually diminishing at the moment and there are um, not any more as many funding opportunities as it was in uh, 2015 or 16 or 14. Uh, I think the main priority would be creating common place, common, uh, building common places, common spaces for the Syrian civil society actors to encounter with each other. I do, we have observed that there were deep fragmentations, but at the same time, when the uh, diaspora actors come together, they were able to discuss. So I think what the international stakeholders can provide is uh, to give, to provide a space to find commonalities, that common points, for example, focusing on uh, the common challenges and needs of the organizations without, doing, without going into the political discussions. So first of all, bringing together the different diaspora actors to share their aspirations, their objectives and missions. But I do believe that this is still an internal process which can only be triggered by, by supported by the international community. But I think the peace process or the, this process of uh, overcoming the fragmentations mainly lies in the, uh, in the diaspora actors themselves. It's an internal uh, process, I believe. Yeah, and I want to add to this that there are already quite a lot of networks and uh, spaces for cooperating the diaspora actors, which I see is really also kind of very uh, bottom-up process rather than top-down. So this is also what I observe, we observed in the, uh, in the research that often if kind of network structures are imposed by policymakers or by external actors, actually they tended to be less um, function, less well functioned and less efficient and more be more prone for fractal further fragments actually compared to networks which were more bottom-up driven. So I guess it's as Eleni said, so there can be a facilitation of providing space, maybe providing also funding for specific networks, which I think is also something which many networks often tend to lack, but not necessarily really be the one uh, imposing a network or in trying to uh, create networks or uh, mechanisms of cooperation, because this, at least from our findings, we saw that this is often actually hindering uh, a more certain that process. And then again, of course, when it comes to, uh, yeah, uh, discussions of cooperating, uh, I guess it's always also important to understand the diversity and see the diversity as something positive. Because often Syrians, uh, the diaspora actors sometimes tend to frame the fragmentation as something negative, but at the same time, they also acknowledge that it's for the first time that there is the plurality of voices in the Syrian context. So the plurality of voices is also something which on the one hand is needed no, for a lively and well-functioning civil society. Okay, thank you. There's another question about um, the gender, uh, gender mainstreaming approach that you might have taken in your research. 
And in particular, if you were able to highlight any specificities for Syrian CSOs and diaspora um, that were working on the issue of women's rights in particular. So maybe I start and, and then you can focus. So there are different uh, women organizations also among the uh, Syrian civil society in the diaspora, but also outside. But there's also, for example, Syrian Women Network, which actually initiated inside Syria, but then became diasporic in a way because to, due to displacement. So I say that there are specific actors also in the Syrian diaspora who are more, yeah, yeah, who are women led and also try to encourage uh, a more gender mainstream. But what we also see in some organizations say that, and this is what Eleni also mentioned, there is also a research uh, published by Impact, uh, which is also a civil society organization in Germany, which looked at the gender dimension, which also said that within the civil society, there's a need for a kind of yeah, mainstreaming uh, gender in a way that it becomes kind of a uh, woman become more represented in decision-making power. But I would say again here, this is also something where we see um, also, not more recently, but also increasingly that there, there is uh, woman-led initiatives to kind of um, focus on these uh, two, yeah to promote the role of women in different area. And I think this is something which also the future might uh, have more contestations around even within the civil society landscape. Uh, but we also have to add that it was one of the main limitations of our study because we were we, uh, among our participants, we only had 10 uh, women participants. And this was mainly due to the workshop, the methodology that we used. We in invited civil society organizations to a workshop and we were not able to control our uh, control who is going to participate. So next time it's a learning for us to make a more targeted effort to include more women. Okay, thank you. We have another question about the, the topics of interest for the CSOs that were interviewed other than political. And I think that actually gets to something that you mentioned um, earlier, which was about the, if we do create a common space uh, for dialogue and for exchange, um, what are the commonalities? Uh, I know the research we've been conducting with our, with our Iraqi partners on the Iraqi diaspora, for example, has shown that um, it's actually quite difficult to find common ground right now on political issues because of the fragmentation and because of what's happening in Iraq that is actually reinforcing fragmentation in diaspora, in the diaspora. And so things like cultural heritage protect protection might be a common ground where we could bring together different diaspora groups and different forms of mobilization. And so I'm just wondering in response to this question, what are some of the, the topics that do unite different groups outside of political issues? I feel maybe this is more <clears throat> now uh, based also on my observation in my PhD, which for on the German context, but I felt initially at least the humanitarian aspects could unite more than political, but it was actually in the earlier stages. Then there has been also discussion, okay, the, the whole response got kind of neutralized due to this focus on humanitarian <clears throat> action. But I feel that, for example, the... Um, uh, we see that at least what I perceive that integration uh, aspects on integration, so aspects on the host country level, which were more unifying than actually aspects related to Syria. So we see that maybe due to the more commonalities and challenges when it comes to uh, the host country context, I felt that these are areas where people can align more easily. Yeah, I also agree that like also in your presentation, in Nora's presentation, we have seen, we have somehow observed that the attention is moving from uh, building communities inside Syria towards building a Syrian, strong Syrian diaspora abroad. So I also uh, feel that integration, social cohesion in different dimensions, especially like for organizations that are providing direct assistance to refugees and asylum seekers, I think among these organizations, there is already this like even if the political views are different, I think they they are able to find common ground for action, and I think this could also be the, provide the base for further uh, points of uh, like finding reconciling opinions uh, or 
finding a way to work together despite diversity of views. Okay, we have a question as well about the disconnect, disconnection between the professional civil society and urban centers and the reality on the ground. Um, question relates particularly to Lebanon, um, the case of Lebanon, where we might have seen a more um, elite, uh, Syrian elite but, uh, in civil society, but that has left the front line and who is then left behind to sort of shape what's happening in terms of the mobilization and about what's happening on the ground. And I know this is something you address in your study as well, is this the level of connection between those in diaspora and what's happening on the ground and how that's affecting um, the dynamics in terms of the actual impact in Syria. I think uh, I, I don't. I can start <laughs> um, with uh, what I also uh, what we also saw in the discussion, and it relates also a bit back to your point, which you said with the different strategies, for example, shifting towards another context. No, and I think there is also a kind of um, a perception that actually the more professionalized you get, the more you actually lack the real uh, connection to the ground. So it's on the one hand being out, outside, being the diaspora, which I feel makes you already distant. And of course, in, uh, in the neighboring country, maybe less so, but also still um, just to a certain area of Syria. But also the level of um, 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 professionalization, and I guess there is this trade-off between being a diasporic in on the one hand, which really focuses on identity and which also has this homeland as a center in the identity of an organization, where it's becoming more international, which is then more professionalized international NGO. And uh, with regard to the elite, and I think this is something which I observed also in my own research, but also in the research we did, is that, of course, the, those who are mobilized, uh, it's, I mean, cannot be in, or are not necessarily representative of the whole uh, society. You see, so in order, those who create and establish organizations who engage mm -hmm. tend to be to a certain degree an elite. No? And here again is the question of how much connection a civil society can have to the lived experience of other Syrians who are more marginalized, both inside Syria, but then also even in the context of Lebanon comes to a, yeah, um, the displaced population there. So I, I think it's a very interesting question to understand different dynamics. And what we tend to see often that diasporas often create their own imagine, or image of the home country, which does necessarily reflect the situation on the ground. I can also add one thing here. So I, I also think the professionalization of these organizations are taking place in a highly politicized context, like in Lebanon or in Turkey. So within this context, if an organization is able to grow, uh, master the way towards being a professional large scale organization, it also means that they were able to, they had to make the compromises. Not, I'm not generalizing, of course, but this also, this is also something we see, uh, particularly in the Turkish context. That, uh, and then with these compromises, they also diverge from, <clears throat> sorry, diverge from uh, the political, the, the views of the grassroots organizations who didn't have to deal with all this, uh, the, the requirements or the silent requirements that are imposed by the governments or grant giving agencies. So I think this is also creating a, uh, a challenge. Okay, thank you. We have actually a question about maybe this pertains to, to methodology, but it's regarding Jordan and why Jordan was not included in your in your um, your research. Uh, yeah, I mean, indeed, Jordan could be interesting uh, space, and we initially also had uh, it in consideration, but then it was yeah uh, funding constraints and uh, also time constraints of doing. It's uh, 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 yeah, uh, or selecting the cases, and we thought that Turkey and Lebanon are inter uh, interesting cases because they are very distinct from each other, but also share some similarities as also the conflict involvement and the regionalization of the conflict in both um, uh, regions. But indeed, Jordan was actually also under discussion, and yeah, it was a kind of a more pragmatic decision <laughs> on the one hand, not to focus also on only two neighboring countries. Mm 
yeah, this is an honest <laughs> answer to it. Okay, I think we have time for just one one more question, maybe right now, which is about um, about something we're seeing right now in Europe, uh, which is the issue about um, return to Syria. Um, that we might be seeing new policies that are favoring return pressures to uh, have Syrian refugees in Europe or Syrian migrants yeah, return to Syria. Um, and of course, there's uh, there's real issues with that, real ethical issues with that. Um, and the tension between those who work to depoliticize and the Syrian survivors of torture and war crimes who are themselves fighting for justice using what you had described as universal jurisdiction um, and trying to actually have a process and put pressure to have some transitional justice and some accountability uh, for the war crimes. Um, so the question is, how do you see a way forward to this uh, as long as the Syrian regime and its loyalist networks in Europe are still firmly in place? I mean, we have a recommendation on the issue of uh, return, and, and of course, this was also highly discussed, especially actually in Denmark, where there is a huge uh, public pressure or public discourse actually on return. Uh, but it happened also in Germany at the level that some states said, okay, we could now identify regions inside Syria where, where it's uh, safe to return, which also happened in the context of Afghanistan. So there is this presence, especially also, not only, I mean, in Lebanon, the, they, they had even the return agreement with people. So it's uh, something which touches uh, the reality, actually, the experience reality of people. And yeah, our recommendation, I mean, there is also a lot of advocacy work uh, being done to challenge this kind of discourse as an obligation and moving it more into the direction of the right to return. But the right to the return then be, would be only feasible under these conditions, under a condition which ensures your human rights, your but also economic security and your, your freedoms and uh, even your life you know, in some cases of different people. So we see actually that return is there and a return for many of course is also an aspiration and the on the one hand it's also an, uh, for many people still a home and people may want to return but not under this situation or they wouldn't be able to return as well so our recommendation was really a shift towards understanding or not using a discourse of obligation but more a discourse of rights and but also a right to remain and to reside in the country as long as the situation is not safe and Eleni, I'm not sure if you want. Yeah, I, I just want, yeah, I think you covered everything, but just wanted to add that this is also return issue is also used by political actors in host states mm -hmm. uh, as a way to gain votes to, for the political and uh, domestic political affairs. So it becomes, it's just used to the agenda all of a sudden and then it disappears. So we see that it's actually the functionality of circulating these discourses rather than the actual. Uh, the, rather than facilitating return. Of course, we also see in Denmark, in France, that there are now new regulations to facilitate return of refugees. We don't know to which extent the, the Syrian refugees will be um, uh, victimized with these uh, uh, regulations. But yeah, we see that the discourse is rising. But you know, the, the, yeah, as Nora said, our, in, this is also in our recommendations. There's also the wish, it's also about the, uh, promoting the safeguarding the wish to remain and also uh, enabling uh, providing enabling conditions for those who wish to return yeah, yeah. okay thank you so much uh, I, I i said that that would be the last question but i actually see there's one last one that has come through chat which is about and this is, i think this is an interesting question because it has to do with uh, to a certain extent um living internally what is sort of the changes you may be to see externally the process of prefiguration and uh, the, the question is about the internal dynamics within these civil society organizations if you're seeing experimentation in terms of the organizational models to produce new forms of maybe democratic governance internally um, maybe horse, more horizontal structures um, different forms of representation so to what extent you're seeing that the internal models that these CSOs are using are actually trying to do something new and maybe something different than maybe traditional um, experiences of civil society organizations um, in Syria. Okay I yeah, can, can start this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it has been 
So this civil society organizations established after 2011, it has already been nine years. So it has been a long road and they have been uh, engaged in many different projects. All of a sudden people with different, totally different occupations found themselves in the civil society environment. And I do think that the unconventional methods or new methods have been uh, uh, used uh, widely. And, uh, but of course we are not able to generalize. Uh, and of course, there are so many different types of, it's a very heterogeneous group. And you also see um, other uh, less, um, uh, less more traditional ways of uh, hierarchical or less egalitarian ways of uh, management, but also a lot of horizontally organized organizations who pay, who try to give attention to diversity, to inclusion of different communities, women empowerment topics that are usually out of the radar of, uh, let's say, more traditional organizations. So I do believe that uh, there has been a lot of changes. Um, also in the organization, but also in their missions, the objectives uh, in general. Now, I don't know, Nora, if you would like to add. This is also about the needs and resources, which we also had a few slides on, but then we removed them because of the time constraints. And I think we also discussed this in our report when it comes to resources of the civil society organizations. No, I guess it's really, uh, and I agree with Eleni that it's also, on the one hand, I see sometimes that, especially of the younger generation, so the younger activists, they make use of much more horizontal uh, ways of organizing with each other. So it's also a generational aspect on the one hand, which I observed, uh, or we could uh, also observe in this study. Uh, and additionally, what I feel, it's also, as Eleni said, the learning, no? So people started, and now I go a bit back from this study, but to my PhD, when I interviewed people in 2012, they had a name which was four lines long. So, and then uh, they had discussions on uh, which logo or which name to choose. And sometimes organizations split up just because they couldn't agree on a name. And this is what happened in the beginning, but it's also people said, and this was also actually addressed in our um, research that, okay, there was not a history of an independent civil society in Syria. I mean, we have seen the Damascene Spring, we have seen, uh, of course, uh, a whip ripened uh, civil society action, but it was always being repressed. So um, civil society was maybe sometimes more related to the wife of the president, Asma, instead of um, actually an independent way of organizing. So this, this is something which has been also learned throughout the process, no? how to work with each other, how to understand different perceptions. So I agree it's quite diverse, but I would also emphasize that, that there has been a learning, I would say, over the years. Okay, I think with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and conclude. Uh, I want to thank our speakers very much for such a rich discussion today. We've covered so many different things. Uh, again, for those who are interested, I highly recommend uh, reading their report, which we will make available. Um, and thank you again. Um, hope to see you everyone again for our uh, next uh, webinar in this series. Thank you so much thank for you. the opportunity and the really interesting questions um, and discussion points. Yes, thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day, everyone.